and welcome to the BFI London Film Festival's Industry Programme. My name is Rowan Woods and I'm the Festival's Industry Programmer. Of course, usually this event would be taking place in one of our lovely cinema partner venues, but thank you for joining us in this unusual format in this most unusual year. Before we start, I just want to say thank you to Film London and the Mayor of London, who are the sponsors of the Press and Industry Programme this year. We've been thrilled this year that two of the standout films in our programme come from the pen of the same writer, director and playwright, Kemp Powers. The new Pixar film, Soul, which he wrote and co-directed, and Regina King's blistering debut, One Night in Miami, which Kemp adapted from his own stage play. We're very pleased to present this session in which he will be conversing with Kwame Kweama, artistic director of the Young Vic Theatre. They'll be discussing Kemp's work and the importance of telling black stories on screen, an issue also addressed through the festival's partnership with the Young Vic Theatre and Ida Rose Production Company on a pitching showcase for black writing talent, which will be available as a recorded session on the festival's industry platform over the weekend. I'm now going to hand over to Kwame Kweama, who will lead the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, most importantly, actually, for facilitating this catch up, because I'm here with my soul brother number one. And this is no joke, we've sat in this position having these conversations many, many a time. Um, I cannot express how proud I am of brother Kemp Powers. And as you've said, two, not just one, greedy brother, Go have two films at the London Film Festival. Uh, as you said again, um, the screenwriter for the wonderful One Night in Miami and the co-director and screenwriter for Soul. So brother Kemp, before we get, before we get in, I just yeah. want to do this, yeah? Just want to do this. Just want to go, yay! Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's kind of a whole isn't it? This, this time, exactly this time, Four years ago, Four years we ago, were yeah. previewing One yeah. Night in Miami at the Don Mar Warehouse here and it in was London. Return home, wasn't it? Wasn't it like? And it was. Yeah, <laughs> it was. It was my first. It was in, in my first directing debut in Britain, actually, for yeah. for, for a year, for seven years, eight years. Um, yeah. And so, you know, isn't it? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? I, I want to congratulate you on your intelligence, on your artistry, on your game playing, brother. And I don't mean game in a pejorative. I just mean in knowing how to move through what is a quite hard system to be here in London with two films. How are you feeling, brother? I mean, I'm, of course, I'm super proud, but also I'm heartbroken that I can't be there in person. I mean, as you know, before the pandemic started, I was in London since since One Night in Miami played at the Dunmar. I was there like four or five times a year. So I was kind of becoming a regular, you know, largely thanks to, you know, you and the network of creatives that have become like family to me um, since that that Dunmar production. So, I mean, the only it's somewhat bittersweet because I just couldn't believe that I had that both of my films, you know, both the films that I worked on landed at this festival. I just wished that I could be there to, to kind of celebrate with you and the rest of the brotherhood, because I really do think that that production at the, the Dunmar kind of like, there was something special in the air. Let me put it that way. Um, and, and I think it really, it, it opened, I can't speak for you, but it definitely opened my eyes to, you know, the, the, the fact that, you know, there our stories really do have value because you know at the time that that we opened at the Dunmar, I I, I knew the theater very well from productions like um, Red, um, you know, or or productions like um, Cabaret with with Alan Cumming. I mean, but I was not aware of there being many um, black stories, stories you know featuring black characters written by black writers, directed by black directors. Um, and, and I'll admit there was a little bit of a concern about how an audience that wasn't accustomed to seeing us on its stage would respond to, to the piece. So it was such a pleasant surprise that we got um, at the time an unusual thing, like a standing ovation from that first preview, you remember. So I don't know, it was just, there was something about um, being in London, a place, you know, it's, it's though to me, it's ground zero of, English speaking theater and to have your work received so warmly in that place, despite all the naysayers along the way that really opened my eyes to, to the potential of 
not just my like not just the potential for me and my career but the potential of our stories like i said our stories having true value so it really kind of started there and 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 in truth uh you know uh you, you also got a Laurence olivier award for it nomination uh, yeah uh, do you know what i mean oh, nomination sorry yes yeah. of course and it, I mean, but really for us, and I'm going to spend a little time talking about One Night in Miami. We will spend a little time talking about the magnificent soul. And then we'll spend a little bit of time talking to just about the world and, and, and negotiating the world um, as black artists and as, and as people who, who don't and have never had to, uh, to hide that um, in, our, in our work. But I mean, really, our, uh, you know, just for those uh, at home, as it were, um, my relationship with One Night in Miami began when I got a phone call from one of my board members and uh, when I was the artistic director of Baltimore Center Stage and said, you got to go and see this. you got to go and see this play. It's in a 99-seater in Los Angeles. You, you just need to go see it. You need to go see it. And, uh, and so I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then eventually it was a Saturday morning and I was lying in bed reading scripts and I got to about page 12 and I went, are you kidding me? <laughs> this exists and this is this dope and I remember at the time calling up getting a flight and flying to Los Angeles the next day to see the Sunday show now Kev, and it was it was it was breathtaking and brilliant and raw tell me a little bit though or tell us a little bit and this is the story that that made me fall in love with you as a man as a mind and as an intellect Tell me, tell us the story about uh, having the rights or not having the rights to, uh, right. to, to tell some of this story. Right. Well, you know, One Night in Miami was actually my first produced play. And um, before I was a playwright, I was a journalist for almost 17 years um, and a tremendous fan of all four of these men. But specifically, Sam Cooke was someone I was you know, particularly fascinated by. So in in writing the play, of course, especially writing the play with Sam Cooke as a character, one issue that comes up, of course, is, is the music. Um, and basically, um, we, like you said, we did it at a small 99 seat non-equity theater. Um, there's no way to sugarcoat it. We didn't have the, the rights to any of the music. Okay, so technically the first <laughs> production started off illegally. Um, <laughs> and so, um, Immediately after the show opened and the first critics, you know, reviewed the show within a matter of a couple of days, um, of course, I got a call from a lawyer um, from, from Abco Records, um, which is the record company that actually owns the rights to Sam Cooke's entire catalog. Um, and I got on the phone with, um, quickly got on the phone with Jody Klein, who is the president and CEO of Abco. And he, it turns out Jody had flown out the first weekend and seen the play. In, in person. So it was a very awkward, you know, it started off very awkwardly. Um, and with Jody asking, he's like, so I saw your play one night in Miami. And I, you know, I have to ask, why didn't you approach us to get the rights to the music? And um, I pretty matter of factly said, you know, one, I knew you would have said no. Um, and two, I figured if you saw what I'd done, either you would sue me or you would actually produce this play. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I guess I was lucky in that Abco Records came on board and became a producer um, at that point. So, you know, it's a, I think it's an extreme case of kind of taking a huge risk and betting on yourself. But you have to understand that, like, this, this story, as I structured it, was something that was incredibly hard to pitch to people and get them to get behind. Because in most versions, when you tell people about these four men being in this room on that night, um, people's commercial brains go to this place of, well, my, this, is a, this is a play about Muhammad Ali. He's the most famous athlete in the world. You, you've written it wrong. It should be about Muhammad Ali. And from the very beginning, this pitch was actually the central conflict is between Sam Cooke and Malcolm X. And... I figured that it, it, it's very interesting to, when you say that, you, you, a lot of people, Malcolm X might be a controversial figure to some people, and Sam Cooke, as familiar as people are with his music, a lot of people don't know his background. So it was so impossible for me to make the case to anyone to even structure the play in the way that I wanted to write it, 
that I figured I just had to go ahead and do it and, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Look, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, at that stage in my life, there wasn't much money to sue me for anyway. So it was, uh, it was like, okay, I guess I can, I guess I can live with, you know, someone taking this little bit that I have in my, my bank account, but I was genuinely confident in that story as I was trying to write it, connecting with people. And a lot of it was because honestly, Kwame, the debate, the central debate between Sam and Malcolm is the debate that goes on inside, not just my, but I think most black men's minds when they make decisions about their life and career. It's this, it's this debate between like, do I have to sacrifice who I am as a black man in order to fit in? Um, and, and, and all I did was reverse engineer this thing that goes on in all of our psyches back into the mouths of the men who gave us those idea, ideas and who epitomized those ideas. And I was pretty confident that if other men like me and women like, and black men and black women saw this happen and saw this play out, I felt confident it was going to connect to them on a visceral level. So, I, I mean, did. again, I, 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 I was I lucky, man. And, and you well, I, I, love, I love that story, brother. I love that story so much because that's like rolling the dice and betting on yourself. And uh, yeah, as you yeah. said, and, and I, again, again, as you said, that's, <laughs> I don't think everybody should do that at any one time. But, but, but sometimes you have just got to go, I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm, 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 I'm going to do it. I, and I that's remember. how much I believed in the story. This, it was just this story that I believed in that much. And I got to yeah. give like so much credit to Jody Klein for being amenable, you know, and you know, you know Jody well. I mean, he was a producer, the co-producer when it ran at the Dunmar. I mean, he fell in love with the story. So instead I mean, actually, of like- the, In truth, as so, you know, and again, you're right, because we first bought it from immediately from, from you to, to Baltimore. And again, right. you know, we'd have Jody in rehearsals and, and he was an absolute supporter of this project. Yep. I mean, yep. all the way. And then, as you say, then a co-producer when we brought it to London. Now, we know between the two of us, you know, the amount of work that you put in, because it's really easy to say, hey, here are these four heroes and I just put them in a room and off they went. I mean, this was meticulously researched. Um, your yes. journalistic brain um, w was in full effect. Just, just talk a little bit about putting words in the mouths because nobody really ever reported what happened in that room, but, right. but, but you had to put words in the mouths of people we are familiar with, but yet have it be based on fact. Just talk, talk through a little bit of that. Right, I mean, the, the interesting thing was when I first found out, of course, this was a very real night, the night, February 25th, 1964, when Cassius Clay beat Sonny Liston. He did go back to Malcolm's room at the Hampton House and spend the evening, most of the evening, in quiet conversation with Malcolm, um, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke. And the next morning is when he announced that he was in the Nation of Islam. So that is a fact. Um, and when I first read i remember i remember the specific book in which i first read that paragraph that mentioned it it was a book called um redemption song muhammad ali and the spirit of the 60s and it was written by mike marcusi who was uh the late mike marcusi he was a british a london-born um sports writer and it was about the intersection between sports and the civil rights movement so when i first made that discovery in that one paragraph in his book I was planning to write a book about their friendship because I was still a journalist at the time. So I went down this rabbit hole with years and years of research on the intersection between these four friends. That night in Miami was a pivotal night, but I wanted to know how did these guys meet? You know, how did they all become friends? And again, one, you could, everyone knows about the relationship between Ali and Malcolm X, but Sam Cooke was really the oddball right there. It was like, what's he doing there? And when you started digging into Sam Cooke, you went like, wow, this guy was kind of working within the system. And there were little things, little tells that I'd never noticed before. Sam Cooke always, from, for most of his career as a pop star, had a natural afro. That's a big deal. His contemporaries were Lil Richard and Jackie <laughs> Wilson. So Whipping, Sam, baby. Yeah, so <laughs> people tend to, I think, make Sam Cooke more contemporary than he actually was. He actually predated Motown and was rocking a natural fro when the Temptations would come out later and even they had conks. So Sam did these very subtle tells that kind of, I think, alluded 
to the influence of people like Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and Jim Brown and this idea of like black self-reliance. I, I like to tell people, I saw these four men not as the civil rights movement, but as the nascent black power movement. And that's a key, key difference. So no, having that information, knowing, I just figured, you know, knowing everything I know about these guys, when I decided to write it as a play, knowing everything that was leading up to that night and everything that would happen within 12 months after that night, it was, I could pretty much ascertain if these guys were to have a debate, if these guys were to talk about what's on their mind on this given night, what that conversation would entail. And then from there, it was about, okay, now let's forget about them being icons because the doors are closed. So just like, you know, a, a, it's like a famous person comes home, the, ca the cameras are flashing, they close the doors and they relax. Let's be motivated by like them as human beings, them as real people. And for that element of it, you know, I took all the information I had, but then emotionally, I just went, honestly, Kwame, I went back to the same debate that I would have with my friends at like the freshman dormitory at Howard. You know, it's the debate. <laughs> it's the debate that groups of black men have been having for God knows how long. You know what I mean? It's like when you talk about you you talk about Lincoln Perry and Steppenfetch, right? He was yep. both he was one of the first black millionaires ever known. But hey, in order to become a millionaire, all he had to do was perpetuate negative images of black people that would affect infect us for generations. We would have visceral debates about that <laughs> in college. Yeah. So it was like, I want to bring those visceral debates to this play. But again, so, once again, put the, put the idea, put the words into the mouths of the guys who influenced that manner of thinking, whether it be so, Malcolm, so, Ali, mm -hmm. Sam, or Jim. So, so now talk to me about transitioning it from, from a play to a movie, because that, you know, that's a, that, that's a big leap. I know often we see plays as movies, but you've got to rethink in a different way. And one of the things that I that I adored about this is, you know, I know the play inside out. I've been directed it twice. You know what I mean? Right, and, right. And I saw new things in the film. I saw I, I saw an expansion. I, the performances are magnificent. And and Regina did a brilliant job. But I, I also saw you go in and go, okay, let me unlock this. Talk talk to yeah. me about that transition. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted to, you know, as my playwriting career moved on and kind of started morphing into film and television, um, there are rules that you learn. And I really wanted to treat my play the same way I would treat any book that someone gave me as source material, right? So that's meant I had to be willing to kind of tear it down to the studs. And there were elements of the play that you remember were super duper popular that are not in the film. You know, like Sam Cooke at the Harlem Square Club. Yep. That's like a show-stopping moment in the play, not even in the movie. You know, yep. it's not about just recreating these moments from the play on the, from, from the stage in this film. It's like, no, what is the story we're trying to tell with this cinematically? And one thing that I knew was that I still, despite the fact that it's a film, want it to essentially be about those four guys stuck in the room. So... Mm -hmm. You know, one thing we decided that I decided to do was um, show show the audience what led them to that night. And in showing them what led them to that night, show each of these men kind of how they stumbled leading up to this particular night with, with what I, I basically arranged it like four prologues. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I wanted to do was expand and let them leave the room a little bit. <laughs> so the idea of them being stuck in a room was more like being stuck in a hotel. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to expand on, in particular, the relationship between Malcolm and Cassius and to have people understand, you know, the big brother mentor um, nature of their relationship at that time. And another thing I wanted to do was show the fallout of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, one night in Miami, but in reality, you know, the film, as you know, is spread out over basically a year. While yeah. most of it does still happen, I'd say, you know, close to an hour of it still happens in and around that hotel room. Um, I, I just wanted to show elements of the stuff that I knew in the research, what led them to that night and what happened after it. And though, and when you do that, it innately becomes a bit of a tragedy. So in writing it that way, I also wanted to have it still end 
on a note of hope, even knowing that two of these guys were going to be dead within mm -hmm. one year of that night. I wanted to, despite the tragic element of expanding, still end on a note of hope because I think that's really, really key. I feel like we can't give in to cynicism, you know, mm -hmm. and this is a time when people want to feel, want to be cynical. And it, it's just a reminder that like, if they weren't cynical and they could push forward, we have to push forward too. So that was also a really key thing. I mean, I could spend all night talking about the brilliance of that transition that you did from the play to the, to, to the <laughs> movie. I mean, I really could, but I want to move on to Soul. Which, um, which you are the co-director as well as the screen writer for. And uh, I mean, it's a triumph, brother. It's a triumph. I mean, it's yeah. just, you know, I, t tell me a little bit about its genesis, but most importantly, how you moved from screenwriter to co-director to, to, to kind of why you want this out in the ether. Right. I mean, look, I, I've always been a fan of Pixar. I'm sure you have. Pixar is universal. Everyone loves Pixar. Just the way that if you, even if you don't love animation, you could love a Pixar film. So um, ironically enough, um, I got a call one day from my agent saying that Pixar was interested in meeting with me on this top secret project. And of course, the first question I had was like, well, what did they read of mine? You know what I mean? Because um, at the at the time, there weren't many writing samples that I was allowing really to go out for the people to read. Um, and it turns out, and you're going to laugh at this, they read what the play one night in Miami and were, were just interested in having a meeting with me and, and, you know, getting my opinion on something. So I, a driver picked me up from my home in Los Angeles, took me to the airport. I flew to Oakland. Another driver picked me up, took me to Pixar's headquarters. They sat me in a dark theater and they played me. This was several years ago, obviously. Um, an in-progress version of Soul. It wasn't clearly defined yet. It was um, 2D storyboard reels with scratch voice acting. It was about 40 minutes long. So it wasn't, it didn't have like, parts of it were missing. It didn't have a third act. And then Pete Docter, the director of the film, came in and just asked me what I thought. And I gave him my, my honest opinion. I, I saw endless potential, um, but it wasn't a Pixar movie yet. And more importantly, the Black, lead character was the least defined um it just it didn't feel um authentic to me yet and it was like in that moment that i realized you got to understand kwame for me there are some writers i think who think they can write anything and i'm yeah. like the opposite i feel like i can hardly write anything but the things that i write i feel like i'm the only guy in the world who can write it so for <laughs> me it's like either i'm the guy or i don't want to touch it there's no yeah. kind of like plug and play making widgets yeah. version of writing for me. There are people who have that skill of like mm -hmm. just punching up stuff and I don't have it. So I have to make like an almost spiritual commitment to work to really be able to dive into it because of how much I put myself into everything. And that's mm -hmm. pretty much what I did when I came on board with Soul. Um, I gave them my notes. A week later, they asked me to come on board initially as a writer. Um, and it was supposed to be a, I think like a 12 week assignment. Um, and that 12 week assignment very quickly turned into the next two years of my life um, with, um, you know, them asking me to become a part of everything from the edit process to the casting of the film, obviously, um, to to dailies, to the recording sessions. And about a year into the process, Pete asked if I would be the co-director to which, you know, again, ignorance being bliss. I said, well, what does that entail? He's like, you've already <laughs> been doing it. He said, you've already been doing it. It was very like a very Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi thing where I had been painting the fence and waxing the floor. And one day he kind of like hit me and said, oh yeah, you've been directing. So, you know, you're my partner on this and, and I need your help to, to like get this to the finish line. Now understand like Pete Doctor to me is one of the most like brilliant storytellers in, in, in film. I mean, if you look at as much as I love Pixar, Four of my five favorite Pixar films are a direct result of Pete. That's um, Monsters, Inc., Inside Out, Up, and Wall-E, which he wrote. And the only one that's not a Pete film as director or writer is um, Ratatouille. So Pete is like the director, you know what I mean? Like you work with him and it's like you're getting a master class mm. in writing and directing, but you're getting it through like osmosis. You just have to keep your ears open, your eyes open, listen. So much of directing 
is honestly just making decisions and answering questions you know and you have to live with those decisions it's just that it's a it's a decision making job being assertive and being decisive you know yeah. and yeah. watching him and working with him was was it, it felt like i was growing um not just as a director but as a writer and in fact a lot of the lessons that i was learning while i was working on soul i then turned and applied to one night in miami which was getting ready to shoot because keep in mind by now we're overlapping yeah. because yeah. i'd written i'd written the play i written the screenplay once regina came on board i had to kind of like dust the script back off and do another pass on it so i yeah. did that second pass while i was up at pixar um and so one kind of started influencing the other as different as they were um, mm -hmm. and, and I think they help each other out because the Pixar Brain Trust is world famous. It's this collective of incredible storytellers, not just uh, as Pete and, you know, Lee Unkrich and Brad Bird and Andrew Stanton. I mean, these are all just some of the most incredible storytellers and they tear your work apart. They like, <laughs> it's, really, it's the most brutal. I tell people it's like Navy SEAL school for writers. You know, you, I think my, the thing that saved me and made me fit in was my journalism experience. Cause I had such thick skin that I didn't need sugar coating and you don't get it in the brain trust. It's about <laughs> honing your storytelling to a razor, razor sharp. And, 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 and to, to, so what story game did you bring to soul? What, 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 what did you, when you went, all right, I, I don't think that this feels authentic. Those are, those are kind of intellectual conceptual things. What was the story right. you brought to it? What, did, what is the thing that you go, oh no, without me, as you said, that would not have happened. Well, again, again remember, it's all collective. You got 350 yeah, people yeah, yeah. support themselves into this film. But look, the main character, Joe Gardner, when I, when I first came on board, I asked him, I was like, well, in your mind, how old is this guy? They were like mid forties, 45. For, I'm 45 at the time. Um, I said, where is he from? He's from New York. I'm from New York, born and raised there. Um, and he's supposed to be a jazz musician. And of course, like I used to play jazz. My son's named after Charles Mingus. Like I know the world of jazz incredibly well. So I immediately use my own life experiences to kind of fill in this character's life. Um, a mm -hmm. great example would be, you know, there. I think sometimes there's a certain fear about going too much into the black world and the black experience for fear of alienating other groups. And I don't believe in that. I believe that you can go as authentically black, as specifically black as possible. And it's because of doing that, that you actually unearth how universal these themes are. Um, it was a question that came up with One Night in Miami. It was a question that came up with Soul. And I always reply the same way. I said, does me not being, does any of us not being Italian make us not enjoy the Godfather? You see, it's a question when it, when it comes to specificity, it only gets questioned when it's specificity about ethnic groups like black people or Latino people. You know what I mean? Like people of yeah. color. But the reality is cultural specificity is, is drawn, is in, is in some of the greatest works we've ever seen on screen or on stage. So using that as like the foundation my first question was like you have this guy joe gardner who's a black man in new york city a city i know well he's of my generation he has to pass through authentically black spaces because that's part of daily life i'm a show i'm sure in london too if you're a black man in the western world no matter how diverse that world is in order for you to survive you have to spend a significant amount of your time in spaces where a lot of people are like you and it could be for something as simple as getting your hair cut Okay, Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, you're not, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna go to super cuts. They ever get my hair cut. It's gonna have to they're be like, a they're, black they're my bar, they my barber is Italian. No, I'm joking. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? So it was like, okay, I, they get where I'm coming from emotionally, but that has to then work structurally. So then my job is like reshaping the story that, so in a way, so that the, the structure of the story calls for the character to go through these things. So, you know, it wasn't just with the Joe character, it was with a lot of different characters that, you know, I, I came up with and elements of the plot that, you know, I worked with the other writer, Mike Jones, and with Pete um, to, 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 to kind of make it just so that it was really important to me that a black audience member, when they sit there and see this on screen, 
that they get the feeling that someone like who looks like them, who understands them, had a part in creating this. And Absolutely. the thing is, we we usually can. You can usually tell in these very, very subtle ways when the, the artists involved behind the scenes had a hand in, in making this. And, and, and I'm as proud of Soul as I am of One Night in Miami because I've mm. put Soul, I mean, there are conversations that the character has with his mother that's like the conversation you have with my mom, you know? It's I, like, I, <laughs> because once again, Soul is about a Black artist. Who yep. gets to middle? Who gets to middle age? Sound familiar? And then finally, <laughs> has an opportunity, finally has an opportunity to pursue in his life that thing he's been doing on nights and weekends, you know. And so, to his family, they might say, "Well, okay, but we want, we're getting old. We want you to have some stability in your life. Like, do you really want to go and join a band at forty-six years old when you have a stable job? Like, man, I can relate to that on." on like uh, a molecular on a level. cellular level yeah <laughs> <laughs> so let you know again i'm i'm so proud i'm so proud to even be able to tell my children of your involvement in soul and one night in miami uh, as you know my my eldest son kwami came over to baltimore and saw it and i remember him saying really clearly dad i need you to bring this play to london we need this play um yeah. and and with soul i was really proud to say to my family oh this is brother kemp and 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 they could feel you they could they yeah. could feel the the keen intellect and the, and the i was going to say soul but i don't want to say soul but the the acute political spirit that is endowed in this wonderful film when yeah. i'm, I'm gonna I'm, we're in the we're in the last laps so i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna jump to i think we've not spoken about this but um and i'm just checking my watch to make sure that that i am running on time um the, you know, I, I think, Kim, when we were producing One Night in Miami, in Baltimore, we were right at the, um, right at the beginning, I would say, of the first act of Black Lives Matter One. Right. If you remember correctly, we flashed up the images of all yes. of the Black people who being killed by the police. And remember, we'd get a gasp from the audience. And I actually talking well. to everybody going, oh my God, is that too much? Is it too much? Right. Can, can we talk about black lives being killed in this way? And, and, and here we are um, several years later, and actually now we, we, we are talking, uh, we can speak about our blackness in our work. It doesn't have to be about the blackness, but we don't have to, we don't, we don't have to change ourselves and morph ourselves into something else. We can bring our whole self into the space. What's changed, Kem, in really what is six years? What's changed from Ali being our hero, our personal hero, has been one of the few sports people who could actually talk about their blackness and still be top of their trade, to where we are now, where most athletes are taking the knee and are standing up and articulating who they are and what they are at this time. What's changed? I'm trying to figure that out because the term I think we used at the time was unapologetically black, which back when we did this play, as you remember, it's part of what made the play challenging perspective to, to board members and audience members. Um, you know, we got a few, I think one of the first previews of One Night in Miami, um, I remember that, I remember this vividly, one of the first previews of One Night in Miami in Baltimore, one of your audience members, um, I think, told one of the staff members, we gave you your black president. What else do you want from us? Like it was, <laughs> there was, there were some right. visceral negative reactions to yeah, the yeah. play. And I think now being unapologetically black is borderline like in and cool when it comes to the establishment. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in six years, it changed. And I mean, it started even a couple of years before Baltimore. Don't forget when the first production ran in LA, um, the Trayvon Martin verdict happened. And that was a watershed moment. George Zimmerman being acquitted for killing Trayvon Martin, I think Absolutely. was like, that was the real, I, I remember we, the, the, the cast had trouble even going on stage. We had a, a big like two hour Q and A after that. And I don't know exactly, I mean, the, the simple answer is a lot of it's being caught on tape, right? A lot of it's being, and despite so many of these incidents being caught on tape, 
the end result is still the same. People are still not being held accountable. People are still acquitted. Think about how big a deal it was when Rodney King, when the Rodney King thing happened and those cops got acquitted. The thing that made Rodney King so exemplary wasn't that the, what happened to him, but the fact that it was caught on tape. Now, everything is caught on tape and you're seeing these travesties of justice happening with the video evidence. And it's happening sometimes every few weeks, every couple yeah. of months. Undeniable. So I think, I think that's what it is. I think it's the fact that the technology has made it so that these actions and their injustice are indisputable and they're still happening and people are still not being held accountable. So the gaslighting has been revealed for what it is. You know, <laughs> I, I, I want to push. I want. I want to push you a bit on that, brother, because okay. I remember a conversation that both of us had, and now I actually can't remember whether it was in London or Baltimore, but I think it was in Baltimore, where 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 one of the reasons I loved this play when I first read it is because I was just like our modern entertainers and our modern sports people can't stand next to these guys who, as you say, were the precursor to the black right. power movement, right? Right. And that's changed. Where it has and so my, 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 that's right, which actually almost almost, if you were not such a skillful writer, could have taken away the belly of what this was thematically saying and how it was serving. So I ask you, how has it affected your artistry as a black artist who always stood in it, who isn't just being in it because of the new exposure? that it's had. How do you feel? Has it changed anything? Has it validated? Has it, has it become frustrating that everybody can now jump on the bandwagon without, uh, with, without the cost that it may have been to your generation? To a certain extent, I feel vindicated, um, but I'm not angry. In fact, I'm happy. I'm hoping Amen. that, you know, I, I, it, it's what I ultimately wanted. I wanted some of these, because again, this movement, it's always been about young people. And I wanted young people to embrace this thing and not err on the side of safety. So I, I, I believe it was like years ago when this was happening, I, I'd read an article about just like conversations that elders like Harry Belafonte might have yeah. with, with younger generation members like a Jay-Z about their social responsibility. And Look at what, look at the transformation we've seen in that younger, I mean, Jay-Z is of course within our age group, but then you yeah. look at the LeBron James and the Steph Curry's of the world. And yeah. I mean, the, to me, that is great. These guys acknowledging the power that they do have and, and using it to, and, you know, and, and not apologizing for it and using it to move things forward. So definitely not angry because at the end of the day, Kwame, I'm still doing the same thing every day that I was doing six years ago. Nothing has changed in the type of writing I'm doing, the type of work. The only thing that's changed is that more people are open to it now. And Amen. a lot of people are open to it now. They might not be open to my writing tomorrow, but I'm still gonna be doing, this telling, chasing the same kinds of stories that I've always been chasing. It's always, you're riding a wave, you know how this goes. It's ebbs and flows. You can't get caught up on the highs so that you don't get caught up and, 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 you know, discourage when you're in the lows because they're both going to come repeatedly and that's the life we live, you know? Amen, so, my uh, brother. <laughs> I, 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 I profoundly believe that you don't inhale. You don't inhale the high, you don't inhale yeah, the low. Agreed. Brother, agreed. that was a perfect way to end um, this discussion that we would have had anyway. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> now, exactly. And, 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 now, and now we can have it um, with, with other people being able to listen to the pearls of your wisdom, not just through your work, but, but through your brilliant articulation. I, I say this as I have said privately, you are a wonderful man, a wonderful intellect, and I'm proud to call you friend because of the application of your spirit to the work that you do. Um, I'm going to say, people, I know you're going to see it anyway, but one night in Miami and Seoul at the London Film Festival, big it up, big it up, tune in, <laughs> however, it, however you access it, access it, and you will, you will come out with as much admiration for Kemp Powers as, as I have. Brother Kemp, nothing but love. Oh, same here, man. I love you, buddy. Thanks so much. Bless up.